Hello and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. A peace agreement brokered by Russia was signed this week by Azerbaijan and Armenia to end the fighting in Artsakh, also known as the Gorogarabakh. What are the details of that agreement and why did they agree? Doug Becker explores. I'm Doug Becker. On September 27th, 2020, fighting along the so-called line of control between Azerbaijan and the region of Nagorno-Karabakh broke out. Azerbaijani forces advanced throughout the month and Armenian resistance struggled to hold territory. On November the 10th, the two sides agreed to a tentative peace agreement that's been brokered by Russia. This agreement has Armenians both in Armenia and throughout the world rather upset, but it appears it also stopped Azerbaijani advances against a crumbling Armenian military position. On today's show, we will explore the details of the agreement and the motivation of the parties to agree to stop the war, what it means for the region, and whether or not a more persistent peace might emerge. Our guests are Robert English, Associate Professor of International Relations at the University of Southern California. He is the author of Russia and the Idea of the West, and Richard Garagosian, the founding director of the Regional Studies Center, a think tank based in Yerevan, Armenia. He is author of Small States and the Large Costs of Regional Fracture, The Case of Armenia. Uh, Rob, we'll start with you first. What are the details of this agreement? Any specifics that you have on the agreement and and what were the motivations in the parties in signing the agreement? It's a ceasefire, a tentative peace agreement We would love to see something more comprehensive that leads to a lasting peace, but this is a ceasefire, at least in its own right. And as all ceasefires, it halts the conflict in place. So the territory that the Azerbaijani side has occupied in the last month and a half, six weeks of fighting, they hold on to. Secondly, the Armenian Karabakh forces are required to cede more territory. Um, And this is territory outside Mm -hmm. the enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh that they had um, essentially conquered back at the beginning of the 90s, creating a buffer or security zone around Karabakh. So that's part two. They have to give that territory back. In my rough estimate, roughly 40% of Karabakh is now back in Azerbaijani hands. And then 100% of this buffer zone, or 99% is returned, with the exception of a small corridor that will connect Karabakh to Armenia proper. Um, Third, there is supposed to be, or I should say third and fourth, of course, there's supposed to be exchange of bodies, of prisoners of war, of of others who have been seized. And um, that will be also inviting in the um, UN High Commissioner for Refugees. So that's the only outside or multinational agency that's brought into this. And then there's also provision for opening roads. It says roads and commerce, which we don't know exactly what that means. Does that mean that the blockade of Armenia from Turkey will end or from Azerbaijan? Or does it just mean get the roadblocks out of the rubble out of the roads in the conflict zone? But they're supposed to reopen roads and and bridges and all that for commerce. It also includes two new roads because with the change, with the advance, the Azerbaijani forces, the highway connecting Karabakh's capital, Stabanagert, to Armenia proper is now interrupted because the town of Shusha was taken by the Azerbaijanis along the way. So they'll actually have to build a new road. And this is going to be overseen by Russian peacekeepers and reinforce that. Meanwhile, another road is built in a completely different place, connecting Azerbaijan with its exclave, Nahichvan, in a different part of Armenia. And that'll be interesting We'll talk about that later if you like. And finally, Russian peacekeepers. There are at present 1960, I think, 1,960 personnel. I think I read from the Russian Ministry of Defense, I think 380 armored personnel carriers and another few dozen uh, specialized pieces of equipment and vehicles. And that has a five-year mandate. So the Russians for at least five years will be patrolling and keeping the peace. And it has a provision for renewal. In fact, it's automatic renewal unless one of the parties gives six months notice and says no. Those are the essentials. And the big question everyone's asking, and I'll be quiet, is what about the status of the remaining 60% or so of Karabakh with the main population centers, with the capital of Stefan Aguert, that is still under Armenian control? Is that going to gain some kind of independence? Is that going to revert 
to some kind of administration under Azerbaijan? Is there some kind of middle ground with autonomy? We don't know yet. That is not spelled out. And that's why many say this is only a ceasefire. It's not a lasting peace. And a quick reminder, the size of this territory is actually rather small. The going to care about region, what Armenians call Artsakh, is uh, my understanding is roughly about the size of the state of Delaware. So it's a pretty small area. So what Rob just described, you know, certainly seems extremely favorable to the Azerbaijanis. I can imagine this is not being received terribly well in Armenia. And of course, those are the reports. So Richard, can you tell us how is it being received in Armenia and what, what would be Armenia's motivation to, to agree to such a, an agreement? Well, Rob did a very good job at laying out the framework where we are. Most importantly, this is nowhere near a peace deal and very much a forced ceasefire. In other words, it's much less agreement and more ceasing of firing. In other words, from an Armenian perspective, this was a Russian crafted agreement that was virtually forced on the parties to the conflict and especially forced on the Armenian side. Uh, from an Armenian perspective though, I'll be honest, we had no choice. This is the best scenario for one important reason. It saved lives, stopped the fighting, and salvaged what was left of Nagorno-Karabakh. Otherwise, we were in danger and at risk of losing everyone and everything. In this context, however, there is a somewhat natural emotional outburst of frustration in Armenia directed against the government. It's not serious enough to pose a serious challenge to the government, but it is rooted in one crucial element, the government's failure to prepare society for the severity of losses that were inevitable. And unfortunately, the government did a very poor job at explaining after 40 days and 40 nights of fighting why and how we were losing so badly. At the same time, going forward, the conflict is in no way resolved. And we are moving to a new conflict, away from military war and combat operations into the diplomatic negotiations. This is where the so-called Minsk Group, three countries within the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, has the mandate and the monopoly to diplomatically mediate the three countries. It's Russia, the United States, and in many ways, France sitting in the middle, in between Moscow and Washington. What the Minsk group and these three co-chairs are now trying to do is to catch up after a very unilateral diplomatic move by Russia that gives Moscow the leverage they lack the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict was the only conflict in the former Soviet space without a Russian military presence up until now. This changes the map as much as the military gains and losses. So basically, the real struggle is now diplomatic and is only now beginning. Rob, I know some of the uh, analysis for the conflict has emphasized the role that Turkey has played in an alliance with Azerbaijan. So first, is it fair to say that, you know, one of Russia's great concerns was the projection of Turkish power in, in the South Caucasus? And as Richard pointed out, is this Russia seeing an opportunity to be able to step in and exert an influence in a region that uh, saw some external threats, some, some external pressures? I think the answer to the first question is yes. It is a gambit, a projection of power and influence into a new region by Turkey that concerned Russia. It's so early to draw definitive conclusions about even this document, but Turkey is not part of the peacekeeping force. There are no Turkish troops in the region. Turkey will be a participant in a ceasefire monitoring group or a ceasefire consultative group that will meet regularly to discuss problems of implementation. But Turkey is not on the level of Russia in calling the shots or in actually patrolling. So Turkey got a foot in the door, but it didn't walk into the room. I guess you could use that analogy. And what I'm struck by is 
you know, and it's not, <laughs> it's hard to feel a sympathy for me to craft a question that says, uh, well, poor Vladimir Putin that anyone will sympathize with. But there are two streams of commentary out there that are incompatible, both critical of Russia. One is essentially that Russia betrayed Armenia. Russia should have acted sooner. Russia should have come more actively to Armenia's aid. What can that mean but arms and troops? The other says, now Russia is being imperialistic. Now their troops are in the South Caucasus. Well, which is it, guys? You wanted Russian troops there sooner and more dynamically earlier, or you don't want them there at all because uh, Russia is being hit with both strands of criticism. So, but anyway, my job here is not to elicit sympathy for the Russian side, but really to point out the lack of clarity or the lack of conclusive thinking behind that. And let me ask this question to anybody. What would have ensued if Russia had not called a ceasefire halt and injected the 2,000 troops it has, right? This is with threat of greater force, telling Azerbaijan and Turkey it stops now. But what if they had acted a month earlier or, or two weeks earlier and simply deployed troops on Armenia's behalf? Karabakh is located in Azerbaijan. In so doing, Russia would have been literally invading Azerbaijan. And none of us, I don't mean us personally, but I mean the United States, I mean France, the other two Minsk powers, co-guarantors, as well as Russia, and anyone else for that matter, recognizes Karabakh as anything but part of Azerbaijani territory. So again, Russia, did they even have an option to do that? Or what could they have done to act earlier and save more of Karabakh? It, it's a really thorny question. And I don't mean by this that Putin wasn't manipulating and maneuvering and waiting for the moment when he saw this was maximally advantageous. But there were no good or easy early options either, except maybe help the Armenians arm themselves better and be prepared for this onslaught of drones. And that's another whole conversation, how badly they lost on the battlefield um, and they shouldn't have, in my opinion. But that's a separate strategic conversation. The complexities here are awful. And that, by the way, is, is just such a tricky question with respect to peace enforcement, peacekeeping, et cetera. I mean, you know, somebody who studies the UN, the question about sovereign invitation and permission and who actually is recognized as the sovereign can always end up complicating these things. But Richard, I think part of the issue here is the relationship that Armenia has with Nagorno-Karabakh. And most Armenians, though they may state you know, legally what Rob just said is true. Armenians view this as a part of, as a fundamental part of Armenia. How persistent is that? And then I can ask you Rob's question. Had Russia intervened earlier, how different would this have turned out? Let me start by following Rob's thread in terms of looking at Russia first. What we see is very interesting in terms of what makes this particular resumption of hostilities, this war, different than previous rounds of fighting or conflict. Most illustratingly, most significantly, we had on the one hand an unprecedented direct Turkish engagement in support militarily of Azerbaijan's offensive, and even to the degree of operating the military-grade UAVs or drones. In addition to this unprecedented, very muscular display of military support, we had Russia uncharacteristically passive and pensive, holding back, if you will. And there are two reasons, in my opinion, analytically. One is there was a degree of complicity rooted in the very close partnership between Presidents Putin of Russia and Erdogan of Turkey defying the West, defying NATO, in many ways, a collaboration. What's interesting, however, is the second reason. For Russian President Putin, this was a unique, effective opportunity to punish the Armenian government. After a revolution in 2018, a rare victory of nonviolent people power ushered in a new legitimate, free and fairly elected government in Armenia, this was Putin's revenge. And in effect, a reminder of the limits of Armenia's embrace and orientation to the European Union. And in this way, the end result 
was a win or victory for Putin with very little investment, very little cost, unlike Turkey. What Turkey leaves with is an important victory, but much less than it wanted. The victory is Turkey's regaining of its role as the military patron for Azerbaijan, replacing Russia. Russia used to be the number one arms provider to both sides, now supplier and military patron. But Turkey's very upset right now for unfulfilled expectations and diminishing route for a much more robust Turkish peacekeeping deployment with Russia. Russia has made it clear Turkey will be left with a symbolic, rather meager contribution or role overseeing the peacekeeping mandate and mission. And I do think there's friction there. Now, turning to Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, what makes this conflict both unique and stressfully complex to understand is this is a standalone conflict that actually erupted during the Gorbachev period of Glasnost and Perestroika. In other words, Nagorno-Karabakh as a conflict and as an issue predates independence for Armenia, predates Azerbaijani statehood. In other words, Nagorno-Karabakh seceded from Azerbaijan following the terms of the Soviet constitution, ironically. And it is much harder to square the circle between territorial integrity and self-determination. This is why for the Armenian side, there is no debate and little question that Nagorno-Karabakh will never go back to Azerbaijan, hence the challenge. And Nagorno-Karabakh in this context is what I would say is the third rail of domestic politics in Armenia. No political leader of Armenia has ever stayed in power without Nagorno-Karabakh as an issue and in defense of Nagorno-Karabakh. This is an unprecedented challenge for the current government in Armenia. Fortunately, it's popular, legitimate, and democratically elected. So I am a little optimistic. But this is the quandary. This is the challenge. And finally, What's also unique, this is the only conflict and one of the few issues where Russia continues to work with the West and not against the West directly, together with France and the United States. And with the incoming Biden administration, we may see an opportunity here for post-conflict stabilization and to move to a diplomatic resolution. And finally, from an Armenian perspective, the real weakness and the danger is not only the lack of clarity in this agreement over the status, but also the fact that our security and the future of Nagorno-Karabakh and its population now rests with a small, not well-armed contingent of Russian peacekeepers. Our security is in the hands of Russian conscripts who are not very well armed, nor mature or experienced. That's a worry in and of itself. Rob, you know, one of the themes that Richard lays out is how much the roots of this conflict are rooted in the, the revolution in Armenia. And that certainly, as a democratically elected government, Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, as, as Armenians reference it, is such an important issue. How much is the democratization in Armenia, uh, how much is that you know, playing a role in this conflict? The irony being, as Armenia becomes more democratic, conflict could become all the more salient. Uh, there are two lines of answer to that question. The first, I think, is what you are implying or suggesting is that Putin is not happy with the democratic revolution. He's nervous about people power in states on his periphery. So he's negatively inclined towards um, Pashinyan and the current government, democratically elected, overthrew an authoritarian Russia-friendly regime. And so there's some issue of revenge going on here. And that I don't know. I don't think anyone knows what's in Putin's mind. I've seen convincing arguments that this is not the main thing. As long as the neighboring states 
are not clamoring to join NATO, to group with hostile outside powers, hostile to Russia, then Russia has no problem with however they run their domestic politics, as long as it doesn't take on an overtly anti-Russian tone. Others say no, he's afraid of, you know, colored revolution spreading. So he's had it in for Pashinyan all along. I don't see strong evidence proving that he thinks either one way or the other. But there's another aspect to democracy and foreign conflict here. And that is, it's often, and this is going to sound critical of Armenia, but it's happened again and again, that the authoritarian regime, because decisions are made by a tiny group of elites, can be capable of a more moderate and careful foreign policy. But that when you have full-blown democracy, popular passions and emotions come in, and those can actually be upsetting. What I'm referring to in this case is the following. In August of 2019, and in other statements and acts as well, but at that point, most dramatically, Pashinyan said, Karabakh is Armenian and needs to be unified with Armenia. He gave up on the <clears throat> delicate official position, which had been the Karabakh Armenians are deciding their own fate, right? They have seceded from Armenia. They declared independence. We support them as our kin, but we're not trying to annex them and create a, a super Armenia. That's their business. Pashinyan changed that with this declaration, and it infuriated the Azerbaijani side. And maybe it was just a pretext, and they would have gone to war anyway. But some people point to Pashinyan and say, look, we had a decade of Khocharyan before that and Sergsergsyan, and they were much more careful, even though they were Karabakh Armenians, they were a little more careful with the way they framed the conflict. Because once you say Karabakh is Armenian, you're basically saying, forget the mince process, we're not going to compromise anymore. And that was incautious. That was a little belligerent. But it's with the spirit of a popular revolution and the desires of the Armenian people. We saw that in Georgia, right? We had a Rose Revolution, right? And Saakashvili came in and ousted the authoritarian Shevardnadze. And he immediately, I mean, democratic regimes do this to boost popularity. Um, he immediately basically declared that we are going to take back Abkhazia, we are going to take back Ossetia, and it was much more nationalistic. That brought them nothing but bad. I actually found myself in this position at a number of public events as someone always saying caution. In 2018, at the time of the, of the Velvet Revolution, I said, this is great. This is democratic. This is fantastic. But let's not repeat the mistakes of previous democratic revolutions that immediately embraced a little more inflammatory, a little more incautious foreign policy rhetoric that brought them grief. And um, I don't know what I'm saying here. I'm not, I'm not in favor of autocracy or authoritarian regimes, but um, sometimes they are less capable of a steady and um, consistent foreign and security policy than are autocratic regimes. Uh, Maybe most Armenians disagree with me on that. And they think that Armenia bears none of the blame and that they, the Azerbaijanis were gonna attack anyway. In, in which case, my observation is just a footnote, or maybe it's salient. I don't know. Richard, your response? I agree 100%. I think it was an example of impulsive, emotional leadership that defines who and what Prime Minister Pashinyan is. And I'm critical. What's interesting is the situation was even worse. It was not a policy shift. It was an off-the-cuff, unscripted remark playing to an audience without understanding the repercussions. Words are important, and a leader's words are more important. So I agree wholeheartedly. The other problem here is it demonstrates the inexperience of the democratic government in Armenia to this day. Having said that, there is an interesting other dimension here. The war between Karabakh and Azerbaijan was also an attack on an infant democracy, despite the mistakes, shortcomings, and deficiencies that we've noted. In other words, Azerbaijan, probably the worst example in terms of father-to-son transfer of power. It's a hereditary dynasty that has long been corrupted by oil wealth. And I do think that the fact that the Aliyev family has governed Azerbaijan for over 20 years compared to post-revolution democratic Armenia, it's more of an Israel style 
where we're exposed as a vulnerable democracy among much larger, much more powerful authoritarian governments, Turkey and Azerbaijan. This is most important because of the implications. If Armenia completely fails, if Nagorno-Karabakh is lost, this undermines Western values. Public opinion in Armenia may come to the wrong conclusion and say democracy is weak, it's vulnerable, and even our embrace of European values is overturned. And the net result is, despite the impressive nonviolence of Armenia's democratic revolution in 2018, at the end of the day, it's Putin's values of submission, authoritarian leadership, rather than democracy, as the victor or an affirmation. And that's what worries me going forward. In other words, in Armenia, what I'm most worried about is the impact on reform and democracy. We are now having a democracy under threat and reform is dangerously imperiled. Can I, Richard, ask you a question with your long sure. experience about something that's related to that? Because I've been working on this since the mid eighties and I lived in Moscow from 88 to 91 and I traveled to Armenia many times. And in the 80s, there was broad sympathy among educated intellectual Russians for Armenia. And this is the time of Sumgait and the massacres and the escalating violence. And you had right. Andrei Sakharov, right, the conscience of the nation, the champion of human rights, spoke up unequivocally in favor of the Armenian side. And Gorbachev himself was surrounded by Armenians or Armenian Russians because they simply were among the cultural and political elite. I'm thinking of Abel Agamemnon, right? I'm thinking of his advisor, Shaknazarov or Shaknazarian mm -hmm. and, and so many others. And that was simply reflexive. Right. Armenia was a tiny people with outsized cultural and intellectual intellectual achievements throughout Soviet history and Russian history before, of course. So there was no question that Russia oriented towards Armenia. And I watched over 30 years that slowly ebb away. And under Putin, it's much more cynical, it's much more instrumental, but there's also just this passage of time and kind of mutual alienation. I never thought Armenians would be seen by so many Muscovites as just another dark skinned people from the Caucasus, right? hardly different from Chechens, sometimes subject to ethnic violence. Meanwhile, thinking in those terms, I am worried also when I watch the public affairs battle in the West. I have seen the money that Azerbaijan has put into um, putting its image forward. Um, I can't believe when I see buses all over Washington, D.C. saying Khojali massacre. Nobody knows what they're talking about, but they spend an enormous amount. Wow. And, and I wonder, for me, it's reflexive. I've understood this for decades, but I wonder how many of a younger generation of American politicians have, have lost this sympathy and understanding of Armenians as underdogs, as admirable, and they see it like, um, I hate to say it, but he's on the way out, like a Trump administration. Who's got the oil? Who can do us favors? They didn't look at it that way before. And, and it's now become so instrumental. Who can do us favors? Who has, again, the oil, the influence, the pipelines? And Armenia has lost some of um, its precious um, asset, which was its reputation, its, uh, its, its, its underdog, heroic victim of genocide status. Um, I'm not saying the, Armenia, the Azerbaijanis played the PR game better. I think they played it clumsily and spent a bunch of money, but, but somehow the passage of a generation and the salience of what the Armenians endured in the 80s and why we all sympathized with Karabakh has faded. And people see it the way I described before. Well, it's Azerbaijani territory. Armenia should compromise. What's the problem? Um, the well, memory has that's faded. very good. Let me jump in, if I may. First on the Russia angle. What I see when I was in Washington, and I spent 10 years working in the Senate. And as a Senate staffer, meeting Yelena Bonner, Sakharov's widow, Abel was a friend, etc. What I saw was the Armenian influence in the Gorbachev period was unfortunately probably in the wrong camp. In other words, by the time Putin came, after the weakness of Yeltsin at the end, the Armenians were tied to a liberal elite in Moscow that was out of favor. 
never I saw see. the numbers. And in that way, the Armenians in Moscow never recovered after the transition from Boris Nikolaevich to Vladimir Vladimirovich. That's in the Russian context. And in the American context, especially as a Senate staffer, I agree with you. But I think the real blame is us. It's the Armenians' fault, not the Azerbaijanis trying to buy influence, but the fact that until 2018, we've had corrupt authoritarian governments ruling Armenia. That's where our influence and standing dissipated under the governments of Robert Kocharyan and then Serge Sargsyan. It was a missed opportunity. The burden now on a democratic Armenia is to play the game a little better using soft power, where even normalization with, with Turkey was a step in the right direction, a statesmanship, looking forward, not being prisoner of the past only. And I am hopeful and optimistic that that will turn around, especially given the outlook for stability in Azerbaijan is tenuous at best. And I think it's very dangerous that the Azerbaijani leader is riding the tiger of war and nationalism, raising dangerously high expectations. So I do think we can recover, in other words. One of the main themes is that with the end of the conflict, uh, at least the, you know, the ceasefire, and the likely transference of this issue becoming much more about diplomacy, and I would like to add to that, I think one of the potential triggers of this has been a relative you know, withdrawal of the United States from within the region, an expectation that the U.S., Western Europe probably will play at least a diplomatic role in this question. This is going to be an ongoing uh, issue, one that we're all going to need to watch, you know, pretty closely. And I want to thank both of you for providing some tremendous insights into the status of the conflict, the status of the agreement as it is right now, now and a framework for us to think about um, and to analyze where the future diplomatic initiatives are going to go. And with that, I want to thank our guests. Our guests have been Robert English, the Associate Professor of International Relations at the University of Southern California and the author of Russia and the Idea of the West, and Richard Garagosian, the founding director of the Regional Studies Center, a think tank based in Yerevan, and the author of Small States and Large Costs of Regional Fracture, The Case of Armenia. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.